Today we will learn and reflect on the first section of the book by St. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul. In this book, St. John of the Cross seeks to experience the love of God as a lover would experience this love. But he teaches us that before we can do this, we must first work on purging our base instincts, leading us to the capital spiritual sins. So this first part is similar to other monastic hand books like The Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus and The Spiritual Combat by Scapoli, on which we plan another series of videos and blogs. When I first dipped into the dark night, I thought that the danger of the abstruse discussions of spiritual things could lead you away from God rather than towards Him. But the unique insight that St. John of the Cross teaches us about how we should choose our best friends was a true pearl of wisdom that stuck with me personally, making The Dark Night of the Soul one of my favorite monastic works. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along with our PowerPoint script posted to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. St. John of the Cross is a doctor of the Catholic Church in the 16th century. Early in his priesthood, he met St. Teresa of Avila, who was a Carmelite nun, and he adopted her program of ascetic discipline and stricter fasting, seeking to rejuvenate the monastic spiritual life. He followed St. Teresa, she founded a new convent, he founded a monastery, and he became the spiritual director for her community, according to the required practice of the church at the time. And there was a great deal of tension among the Spanish Carmelite friars and nuns rebelling against these strict practices. St. John of the Cross was actually imprisoned by rebellious monks, living under a brutal regime that included whippings, little food, and a little cramped cell until he escaped eight months later. And it took several months for St. Teresa in the hospital to nurse him back to health. Eventually, they received papal permission to found a new stricter order of discalced Carmelites. Who is the attendant audience of Dark Night of the Soul? Monks and nuns, and St. John of the Cross wrote The Dark Night of the Soul to provide his experience as a spiritual director guiding the prayer life of his monks, so their prayers would be genuine. We must first recognize that since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that means that we must get back to the basics spiritually, confessing our sins each week. When we as laymen study these monastic guides, we must allegorize how to apply this advice to our daily lives. Since our daily lives and struggles differ from that of the monastics, in part because monastics do not marry or have children or have formal secular jobs. Also, we must realize that monasteries were more at the center of ancient and medieval culture than they are in the modern world. Now, why would these monks imprison St. John? It is misleading to compare modern monasteries to medieval monasteries or ancient monasteries. In modern times, monasteries and convents are few and scattered, but in medieval times, they were large and numerous. Most young men today who are not sure what they want to do with their life and do not want to attend college, sign up for military service. But young men in medieval Europe did not have this option. There were no large standing armies where you could learn life and career skills. So monasteries were the choice for young men who felt they had few other options. This was also true for a greater degree for young women. As nuns, they found greater independence and opportunities than were available for other medieval women. More women were widows in medieval times, and convents meant that they were not forced to remarry to survive. Which meant indeed that monasteries were a type of spiritual boot camp for these young men and women, who needed far more remedial spiritual training than the often college-educated spiritual men who seek to enter the monasteries of today. Now, in medieval societies, there were three classes in society. Those who fought, the kings and nobles. Those who worked, the peasants and serfs. And those who prayed, the monks and nuns. In medieval monasteries, there was often competition about who prayed the best and who prayed the most. And many monks prayed for extended periods between the hours. St. John of the Cross warns us how even this dedication to a life of prayer can lead to envy and pride and thus lead the unwary monk down the path of imperfection, if not sin. And this first book talks about how easy it is to fall victim to the list of vices, these capital sins, even when you think you're living a life of prayer. And this can be easily adapted to be useful for the layman. Even if we cannot lead a life of prayer like a monk is able to do, 
even if we do not pray or deeply seeking to experience the blinding spiritual life of the beatific vision, which a few fortunate monks truly experience, and which St. Thomas Aquinas only experienced at the end of his life, we can simply interpret the most obvious lesson that St. John of the Cross implicitly teaches to all Christians, laymen included, that we should pray more and more earnestly. St. John Climacus, who wrote a similar guide for monks, The Ladder of Divine Ascent, gives this advice to laymen who wish to adopt the solitary monastic life as best they can in their daily lives. And he teaches us, Some people living carelessly in the world have asked me, We have wives and are beset with social cares. How can we live the solitary life? St. John Climacus replies, Do all the good you can. Do not speak evil of anyone. Do not steal from anyone. Do not lie to anyone. Do not be arrogant to anyone. Do not hate anyone. Do not be absent from the divine services. Be compassionate to the needy. Do not offend anyone. Do not wreck another man's domestic happiness. And be content with what your own wives can give you. And if you behave in this way, you will not be far from the kingdom of heaven. The dark night of the soul also quotes quite often Job's prayer in the book of Job. Job played the role of both a layman and a monk, and the book of Job tells us the story of his dark night of the soul, which is a story of a material dark night as a layman who lost all his possessions and children in a fortnight, and as a story of a spiritual dark night as Job wrestled with God, but never cursed God, seeking the true face of God in a world of injustice. And the dark night of the soul is also very similar to the Song of Songs, the story of the deep love between the lover and her beloved, an allegory of the deep love between the praying Christian and the God he loves. St. John of the Cross also wrote a short canticle on the Song of Songs. I'm just going to read the first verse. Where have you hidden yourself and abandoned me in my groaning on my beloved? You have fled like the heart, the deer. Having wounded me, I ran after you, crying, but you were gone. And this canticle reminds me of the beginning of the very beautiful Psalm 41. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? The first book of the Dark Night of the Soul begins with purging the capital sins that keep us from a deep love of God. And the first capital sin is the capital sin of pride. First, we must overcome the bad habits which arise from the capital sin of pride, as St. John of the Cross teaches us. This pride comes to us through our imperfections, a certain type of secret pride, where we are satisfied with our works and with ourselves, where we seek to speak of spiritual things in the earshot of others, seeking to be teachers rather than learners, acting like the Pharisee, praising God for our own good works and despising the publican. Of course, we always see that our brother is the Pharisee, because we imagine ourselves to be the publican. We never want to admit that we indeed are the Pharisee. Most laymen, out of practicality, do not have a spiritual director to closely monitor the extent of their daily devotions. And indeed, it may not be healthy to have a spiritual director giving such advice blindly to laymen. Abbots or monastic spiritual directors are aware of the daily spiritual struggles of their brothers in their care. They can pick up a feel for the rhythms of their inner life, and that's something that is impossible to monitor for laymen living in the world, whom you only see on occasion. But in the spirit of this teaching, laymen should seek to develop a relationship with a confessor who can more effectively guide them in their spiritual life. We should also choose our priest and confessor with care, so we would be sufficiently trusting in their spiritual direction, that we would follow the advice that they offer when we consult with them in any major life decisions we may be facing, even when their advice may be somewhat hard to follow. Now the devil seeks to increase the fervor of those whose spirituality is for show to impress their brother. For the devil knows that without pure motives that these works and virtues you perform are not only worthless, but they can also become vices. St. John of the Cross also teaches us that those who are so deceived sometimes seek to deceive their spiritual director, not confessing their real sins, but rather confessing sins that don't seem so bad, or sometimes even confessing their real sins to another confessor so they can make themselves look good to their spiritual director. Ah, the games people play. St. John of the Cross notes that these unfortunate souls dislike praising others and love to be praised themselves, and sometimes they seek out such praise. They are like the foolish virgins who, when their lamps could not be lit, sought oil from others. Those who seek God with a pure heart and genuine humility are not as susceptible to the deceptions of the deceiver 
and more quickly progress to perfection with humility, having little satisfaction with their own progress, considering all others as far better, usually having a holy envy at them with an eagerness to serve God as they do. And St. John of the Cross continues, They rejoice when others are praised. They grieve only because they do not serve God with the same fervor. These souls will give their heart's blood to anyone who serves God. Now St. John of the Cross talks about the capital sin of avarice. And although the novice has vowed to follow a life of poverty, giving up all his possessions, he is still subject to the capital sin of avarice. Many monks in the Middle Ages sought to accumulate religious trinkets, crosses, images, and rosaries that they became attached to. St. John of the Cross teaches us, Many can never have enough of listening to councils and learning spiritual precepts and reading many spiritual books, and they spend time on all of these things rather than on works of mortification and the perfecting of the inward poverty of the spirit which should be theirs. Now, how can I defend myself against this accusation from St. John of the Cross? Certainly, it is better to read spiritual books than watch television and watch entertaining videos. And this is yet another reminder simply that we should pray more and pray that our spiritual readings and listenings will truly improve our soul. And St. John of the Cross next talks about the capital sin of luxury. Now, my most vivid memory of the teachings of the St. John of the Cross many years ago was his teachings on who you should permit to be your closest friends. And this is found in his teachings on how the spiritual life can be hindered by the capital sin of luxury. These spiritual luxuries are those central delights and remembrances that hinder our prayer life and our spiritual life. And what a better illustration of this than Times Square at New Year's Eve. These include the central thoughts that creep into our minds to distract us when we attempt to pray deeply to our God in earnestness. So what does St. John of the Cross mean when he says that sometimes the pleasure which human nature takes in spiritual things can be a spiritual luxury hindering our spiritual growth? We need to choose our close friends with care, lest they be a spiritual luxury that clouds our soul and hinders our spiritual life. When our friendship is purely spiritual, the love of God grows with it. And the more the soul remembers it, the more it remembers the love of God, and the greater the desire it has for God. But essential friendship decreases in us our love of God and obstructs our spiritual progress. And if that sensual love grows, the soul's love of God will grow colder and we will forget God as it remembers the sensual love. By analogy, when we fall in love, when we seek to marry, do we seek someone who will make us happy? But if our marriage is both happy and successful, each spouse must first seek to be kind to each other, each putting the other needs first, each seeing the marriage as a monastic calling. Does St. John of the Cross teach us that the same is true in our spiritual lives, that our spiritual life will be like seed sown among the thorns if we only pray to God to solve our problems and ensure our success, or that our spiritual life will be shallow if we pray to God that we be happy and content and not be tested, so we can enjoy the pleasure which human nature takes in spiritual things? And here we're drawing an analogy from the teachings of St. John of the Cross to our lives as laymen and specifically to our lives of friendship and love and marriage. And we should only welcome the love that is both sensual and spiritual. We should only welcome this if our love for our spouse or our friend increases in our heart our love for God. For all our close friendships and our marriages, we need to ask ourselves, do we bring out the best in each other, or do we bring out the worst in each other? Marriage is a monastic calling, and our marriage should be primarily for our children. And the prospective bride should ask herself the key question, Will he be a good father? Will he be good with our children? My comments here are colored by the advice offered in the Divorce Group Support DVDs in the non-denominational Divorce Care Program, which has both Protestant and Catholic parishes hosting these support groups and probably some Orthodox churches as well. And I also would like to mention that there's a Catholic-specific program, which is beneficial since it covers the Catholic Church's teachings on annulments. There are many unhappy marriages in the Old Testament, and there are many less than perfect, though somewhat happy marriages. But we do have one example of a marriage that is truly happy according to earthly standards. But it was a marriage that ended in tragedy and death, and a marriage that was cursed by God because their love for each other did not increase in them their love of God, and decreased in them their love for their neighbor. Which marriage was this? Well, it was the marriage between King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. We can infer they were truly in love, as theirs was one of the very few royal monogamous marriages in the Old Testament. Scriptures tell us that Jezebel did show genuine concern for Ahab's troubles, another rarity in the Old Testament. 
We read in First Kings that Ahab lay down on his bed, turned away his face, would not eat. His wife Jezebel came to him and said, Why are you so depressed that you will not eat? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you my vineyard, because he wanted to keep the vineyard in his family. His wife Jezebel said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Get up, eat some food, and be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Then the evil Jezebel then framed Naboth on a false charge of blasphemy and had him stoned to death, so Ahab would be happy once more. Then the Lord instructs Elijah to proclaim a curse on Ahab. In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, dogs will also lick up your blood. And concerning his doting wife, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the bounds of Jezreel. Many years later, after Jehu overthrew King Joram, son of Ahab, with Elisha's blessing and urging, he marched into Jezreel. We read in 2 Kings, when the deliciously wicked Jezebel heard Jehu was coming, she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window of her palace, taunting Jehu. Jehu yelled up to the eunuchs, and they showed their loyalty to him by throwing Jezebel out the window. And we read in 2 Kings, Some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, which trampled on her. Then Jehu went in and ate and drank, but then he said, See to that cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. Now this doesn't speak too well of Jehu. But when they went to bury her, they found no more than the skull and feet and palms of her hands. Jezebel may have been devoured alive by the vicious wild dogs that today only live in Africa. Their range was likely much more widespread in the ancient world. Ahab also met an early death, but Ahab's curse was realized nobly, twice removed. From the perspective of a pagan warrior culture, the Lord permitted Ahab to die the noble death of a warrior. And since he died in battle gaining Cleos or glory, he gained a pagan immortality of sorts, as the pagan warriors are often remembered in stories retold by their ancestors, as we explored in the videos and blogs on the warrior culture of the Iliad. Ahab died from a spear thrown at him at the thick of battle. He died standing, his blood flowing into the floor of his chariot. Unlike Jezebel, the dogs did not touch his body, but rather when his blood was washed from his chariot, the dogs licked up this water mixed with his noble blood. Now maybe his divine curse was mixed with divine pity that he married such an evil woman who ruined his formerly noble soul. We told the story of Ahab and Jezebel because it is such a vivid example of how we can use scripture to allegorize the teachings of St. John of the Cross and how we should carefully select our best friends in our lives as laymen. St. John of the Cross teaches that the capital sin of wrath happens when we become irritated at the sins of others and keep watch on them with uneasy zeal. This tempts us to see the faults of others, but ignore our own faults. This reminds us of the prayer of St. Ephraim. O Lord and Master of my life, take from me the spirit of sloth, despair, lust of power, and idle talk. But give us rather the spirit of chastity, humility, patience, and love to thy servant. Yea, O Lord and King, grant me to see my own transgressions, and not to judge my brother. For blessed art thou unto ages of ages. Amen. We see an example of vicious wrath in an early story of two brothers who lived a monastic existence with few possessions, who lived their lives solely for the favor the Lord showed them for their offerings. And we're talking about Cain and Abel. Cain was angry when the Lord showed no favor for his offering, and in response to his anger and impatience, the Lord asked Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin is lurking at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. St. John of the Cross teaches the novice to be wary of the capital sin of spiritual gluttony. In a monastery, each monk is assigned a spiritual director who directs him in his penitential and spiritual exercises, his prayer life, so it is sufficient but not excessive. But many monks, lured by the sweetness and pleasure which they find in such spiritual exercises, Strive more after spiritual sweetness than after spiritual purity and discretion. The spiritual gluttony of some continually goes to extremes, ignoring moderation, killing themselves with penances, weakening themselves with fasts, performing more than their frailty can bear, without the order or advice of their spiritual director. St. John of the Cross warns us that we should not strive with great effort for prayer that consists of only experiencing sensible pleasures and devotion that we should not think we have accomplished nothing 
lest we lose true devotion and spirituality, which can be gained only with perseverance, patience, and humility, seeking only to please God. Now we can allegorize these teachings so they apply to us laymen. Don't we often pray to God with a list of requests to spare us from life's trials and tribulations, to spare us and our family from suffering and death? How often have we heard that those who suffer from life's tribulations, how they often become angry when they think God is ignoring their prayers and requests? Then they wonder, is there really a God since he's so obviously ignoring them? We should instead realize that prayer is its own reward. The best prayer we can pray in times of troubles and tribulations is to pray for the strength to endure our trials and temptations so that we may live a godly life and that today we may live a life without sin. And we even have a word for this belief, the Odyssey. Or, why does God permit bad things to happen to good people? Voltaire and other Enlightenment philosophers similarly asked the question, if God is almighty, why does God permit natural disasters, such as the Lisbon earthquake of 1755? An earthquake and tsunami that destroyed Lisbon when the churches were full of the faithful on a religious holiday. Tens of thousands of people died in Lisbon. Most of the buildings were destroyed. And to make things worse, candles lit by the faithful were knocked over causing a massive fire that burned for hours. Now, this term theodicy tells us more about ourselves than it tells us about God. The very term itself implies we are more concerned with our own well-being and how God should take care of us than how we should always, regardless of our circumstances, seek to love our neighbor as ourselves and love our God. And we plan on cutting a video on theodicy sometime in the future. St. John of the Cross warns us against the bad habits and capital sins of spiritual envy and sloth. Envy is the gateway sin of impure thoughts that leads us to all other mortal sins like anger, murder, theft, and adultery. St. John of the Cross teaches that when we fall prey to the sin of spiritual envy, we prefer not to hear others praised, and we become displeased at others' virtues, and sometimes beat down their praises, contrary to the spirit of charity, which, as St. Paul states, rejoices in goodness. And if charity has any envy, it is a holy envy, grieving us when we do not have the virtue of others, but also see joy in the virtue of others, and we delight when others surpass us in the service of God. Now, spiritual sloth and envy endanger our love for our neighbor, and any spiritual exercise that does not increase in us our love for our neighbor is futile, misdirected, and is a waste of time. St. John of the Cross teaches us that we are guilty of spiritual sloth when we fail to find in prayer the satisfaction which our taste requires, when we abandon prayer in the way of perfection, seeking instead the pleasure and sweetness of our own will, rather than God's will. And he also warns us that we should not find it irksome when we are commanded to do that which gives us no pleasure. Rather, we should have the fortitude to bear the trials of perfection. We should not be like those who are softly nurtured and run fretfully away from everything that is hard and take offense at the cross in which they can find the delights of the spirit. Now anywhere in large communities like the medieval monasteries there's peer pressure. The monastic handbooks warn us that demonic forces seek to twist even this benign peer pressure into malignity into a bad thing. An excellent description of this hidden warfare is the work by C.S. Lewis depicting how demons seek to drag down the faithful in his screw tape letters. And this is also a predominant theme in The Dark Night of the Soul. These observations by St. John of the Cross contains a great spiritual truth and perhaps a glimpse into the history of the times. When the soul has only begun its spiritual journey, it finds delight in spending long periods, sometimes whole nights in prayer. Penances are its pleasures, fasts its joys, and its consolations are to make use of the sacraments and to occupy itself in divine things. In these divine things, spiritual persons often find themselves, spiritually speaking, very weak and imperfect. For since they are moved to these divine things and spiritual exercises by the consolation and pleasures that they find in them, and since, too, they have not been prepared for them by the practice of earnest striving in the virtues, they have many faults and imperfections in their spiritual life. But simply, you can pray all night, and you can burn candles all day, you can fast all week, make a show of being all sad and penitential. But if you don't show kindness and love to your neighbor, all your spiritual efforts are in vain. If you don't love your neighbor, then you don't love God, which others have put simply and elegantly, like this country song. And this video will be followed by the next chapters where St. John of the Cross discusses the dark night of the soul and reveals that he was inspired by the writings of Dionysius writing a thousand years before particularly his work, The Famed Mystical Theology, which he seems to reference, 
which is simply grand theological poetry. And we've also cut a video on the interesting history of Dionysius and his mystical works, and how ancient, medieval, and modern theologians and scholars interpret these highly influential works. And this video also has book reviews on Dionysius and St. John of the Cross. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Our source, of course, is St. John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. There were about a dozen manuscripts discussed in the introduction, all of them copies or copies of copies of the original. Like many works written before the invention of the printing press, the original has been lost. But fortunately, the main manuscripts appear to be complete, with few if any missing pages or passages, and appear to be reasonably accurate. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.